Hey guys, we are Sean and Christy. This is Long Long Honeymoon. And in this video, we're going to talk about RV boondocking for noobs, the newbiest of the noobs. We know there are many new RV owners out there and we want to tell you about probably the best, most enjoyable way to use your RV. Boondocking is living the RV dream. It's picking a spot in nature with no hookups, setting up camp and enjoying the great outdoors. In other words, you're using the power and water and shelter and so forth that you bring with you. For example, we are here in the Alabama Hills in California. It's an incredibly beautiful boondocking spot. Typically, if you're in a location like this, which is Bureau of Land Management land, there's no charge to the camping. It's free. You just find a spot that you like, you park, you set up camp and you enjoy. And actually you're free to enjoy a lot more in these parts of the country than you are in national parks. You wanna bring your pet out on a trail? You can do so. You wanna fly your drone? You can do so. You wanna take a dirt bike out and enjoy the countryside? You can do so. But boondocking does not come easily for noobs. It's a learned discipline, I would say. <laughs> right. Made better with practice. First of all, the most logical question is, where can you go? How do you find the boondocking locations? These days, you have more resources than ever before. We typically start looking at Campendium. They have a website. They also have an app for Apple phone users. Uh, if you have an Android phone, they don't have an app, but you can just use the website. It uh, works just as well. You can also go to the Bureau of Land Management website. There are other apps that you can use and sometimes you can even just go to different forums like if you have an Airstream go to Airstream forum if you're an overlander go to those forums online and you can just ask people what their favorite boondocking sites are in certain parts of the country and you might learn about something that's not even listed on some of these well-known websites yeah I know a lot of people like to recommend boondockers welcome we haven't really used that one extensively we typically start with Campendium one of the first issues you've got to consider when you're going to one of these sites has to do with the road quality because some of these locations are very remote and the roads are not only unpaved, they're very unlevel and can have a lot of rocks in them that can be pretty tough on bigger rigs and lower clearance rigs. If you're unsure about a road when you get somewhere, if you can possibly unhitch your rig and leave it and drive in solo just to take account of what the conditions are like. Yeah, it's really smart to scout out a location beforehand if you have any concerns about the size and clearance of your rig getting in there. Secondly, I want to just want to point out that a lot of these sites are not going to be level, so you want to make sure that you have everything that you would need to level your RV rig. I know that's obvious, and these days a lot of RVs are push-button level, but a lot of these places are not really designated camp sites. They're just areas where you go in and park. Yeah, so you might actually need Need more leveling blocks than you normally use if you're a travel trailer but you might even need some leveling blocks in a motorhome because your stabilizer uh, levelers that are built into motorhomes only go so far so you might be somewhere where you need a little help in that re regard as well but the big issue you're going to encounter when you're boondocking concerns water the availability of fresh water and how miserly you can be when you're using it. Tip number one is to arrive with an empty gray tank and an empty black tank and a full freshwater tank. You also want to arrive with some extra water in containers like this. Yeah, we call these jerry cans. Now this is obviously a plastic jerry can that uh, we typically use to refill our fresh water tank. This holds about six gallons of water. So we come in with this full. I also want to show you this water bag. Now this is a pretty clever bag. There are different versions of this bag. We'll put some links to some beneath the video. These fold flat so they don't take up much storage space and they also hold several gallons of water. So here in the Alabama Hills we've been using the bag for our drinking water and we replenish our fresh water tank with a jerry can and that is used for sinks and for flushing and so forth. The really big consumer of water I would say first and foremost is showering. 
So quite frankly, it's easier to boondock in the Western United States where the air is cool and dry and lower humidity. It's a tougher proposition to boondock in the Southern and Eastern portions of the United States where there's a lot more humidity and you're going to want to shower more often. That also brings up the point that it's easier to boondock in colder weather than in hotter weather because obviously in hotter weather you're gonna get hot and sweaty and need to shower more often versus being in a colder climate. You're not gonna be getting as grimy during the day and needing as many showers. So a lot of you ask, why do you guys tend to wander out west every year? And that is a reason because the air is more conducive to boondocking and sort of staying long periods of time off the grid. Another big consumer of fresh water would be washing dishes. So if you're washing dishes on Bureau of Land Management land, there's something that you can do that will help prolong the life of your gray tank because on Bureau of Land Management land, you can actually dump your wash water on the ground, which is usually not allowed in national parks in that sort of setting. You have to dispose of it in like a bathhouse facility that has like a flush just for dishwater. So I have this uh, collapsible tub that I'll wash dishes in and you can just take your tub that has your dirty water in it and take it outside and pour it out. Now, you don't wanna do it right next to your rig or right next to your camping neighbor if you happen to be somewhere where you have a neighbor, but you know, walk it out 100, 200 feet from your camper and just dispose of it on the ground. It's just gonna be your warm soapy water. So if you're concerned about the environment, make sure you're using a biodegradable, you know, earth-friendly wash. But for the most part, you're not gonna have enough soap in there to really harm anything. It's just a nice way to extend your gray tank by using these collapsible tubs yeah. to wash your dishes. And opinions on this topic may vary, but there are some places where you could probably empty off a little bit of gray water without having the full weight of the federal government crack down on you. You have to be discreet about it and definitely check and make sure that it's allowed. I wouldn't just go dumping gray water anywhere, but we're talking about small portions if you need to bleed off a little bit out of your tank. Some people will carry water totes in which you can empty your dirty gray water. We do not carry one mainly because of the storage space that it consumes. We only have so much storage space. Those water totes get really heavy and so most of them have wheels but if you're really getting into the hardcore boondocking scene you may decide you want to get a water tote. It's definitely a good product to own. You could bleed off 10, 15, 20 gallons of water. Now 20 gallons of water will translate to more than 150 pounds of weight. Yeah. So you think about that, moving that around and emptying it. But you can definitely stretch more life out of your gray tanks if you have one of those water totes. Yeah, and with regards to what he said about emptying your gray water on the ground, that's something that you need to check with the local Bureau of Land Management office about because it can vary from state to state. Even though most Bureau of Land Management land allows you to dump wash water, state law is more dominant than the Bureau of Land Management law, so they have to abide by whatever the state law says. So do your research on that. You know, when your Blackwater tank is full, it's kind of game over and yeah. you're gonna have to find a place to go dump your tanks and that's an issue in places like this in the Alabama Hills. Right now we're here in December and most of the local campgrounds that have dump stations are closed. Mm -hmm. So we really have no place to empty our black water tank. So when it's full, we're gonna ramble on to find a dump station. And something you can do to help prolong the life of your black tank is to not flush toilet paper down it. Usually we have no problem using toilet paper in our black tank because we treat it with the proper chemicals and it breaks that paper down. But paper does take up more space. So if you're trying to prolong that black tank, just put your dirty toilet paper in a plastic bag and dispose of it with your trash. And that'll give you a little more room in that black tank. So we found that we can go for sometimes more than a week mm -hmm. stretching out our water tanks. We're on day eight right now. Yeah, so we've gone basically eight straight days just using the contents of our tanks. Now we've replenished the fresh water a couple of times using our jerry cans. So a lot of times people ask how long can you go with your RV when you're boondocking it depends on you, your water consumption, and your RV. Some RVs have larger capacity tanks than others. Mm -hmm. We, for example, have a 54-gallon freshwater tank, a 39-gallon gray tank, and a 28-gallon black tank. But we found that we can pretty comfortably go a week if we're 
in this type of climate where we don't have to frequently shower and we can just be miserly with our water usage. One other thing I use that helps stretch out my need for a long shower, because ladies, you know, washing your long hair will take more water, is I use dry shampoo on days between my showers when I'm washing my hair. So that lets me go longer between times when I need to wash my hair. So if you don't use dry shampoo, look into it. It can be very helpful. The king of all sandwiches. What a sandwich. This is probably the most impressive sandwich I've ever seen in my life. I'm not sure how I'm going to eat it exactly, but it's going to be fun trying. One other thing you can do to conserve your water usage is to avoid using dishes altogether <laughs> because that does take a lot of water. So use paper plates. You can actually burn those paper plates in your fire at night to dispose of those plates if you wish. Also using a grill or something of that nature to do your cooking on will save you water as well because you won't be using pots and pans and that sort of thing. So just be mindful of that when you're planning your menu for your camping outing. The more cooking you can do outside on a grill and and not use pots and pans, it'll just save your water in the long run. So let's talk about power. Power is the other big issue you're going to encounter when you're boondocking, of course, because you're gonna want electricity to run your water pump, to run your heat furnace fan, and to recharge all of those gadgets you lug around, maybe to power your lights at night. And you're gonna find, if you're just using lead acid batteries in your RV and have no other supplemental source of power, your batteries are going to die rather quickly. I can guarantee you that. Especially if you're having to use your furnace at night because even though your furnace uses propane for the heat source, you still have to use electricity to power the fans that blow that warm air out into your RV. So that can really chew through your batteries fast. So a lot of us carry generators to provide a supplemental source of power. That's probably the cheapest, easiest turnkey solution mm -hmm. for providing power off the grid. Uh, there are a few issues with generators. First of all, they require fuel. Most of them are gasoline powered, uh, some are diesel. And secondly, they produce some noise. And the whole point of enjoying nature off the grid is to enjoy peace and quiet. <laughs> you hear the noise around here? Wow. <laughs> this is probably one of the most quiet campsites we've ever had. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generators can't be run 24 seven. You pick certain hours of the day where you can top off your batteries. Now we have the luxury this year of a fantastic solar system that has been installed on in our Airstream. Ours was installed by Ronnie Dennis, who you can find on Instagram at Airstream Nuts and Bolts. He does a great job with these Airstream solar installations. We now have 600 watts of solar panels on the roof. We have 400 amp hours of lithium battery in terms of the Battleborn batteries. And we also have a 3000 watt inverter. We're going to do a video in the near future discussing the the good and the bad of having a solar system like this. Overall, it's an incredible luxury, and I would say it's meeting the vast majority of our power needs by itself. We're here, for example, on a sunny day, we're getting almost 300 watts of free power, so to speak, electricity from the sun. But with that being said, I still think most people are going to want to carry some sort of generator, even if it's just a 2000 watt model, because there are times you're gonna have cloudy days, you're gonna have a shady campsite when solar is just not gonna completely get it done. And that's especially true if you're in humid areas and you need to run air conditioning, then you're gonna need a whole lot of solar to cover an air conditioner. It's just a lot easier to have a generator. Yeah. Now, let's say you don't have a spare $16,000 in your pocket to do a huge solar install. Mm -hmm. There are some pretty cool little gadgets you can get these days that can sort of give you the basics of a solar setup in a very portable package. And I'm talking, for example, this is a portable solar panel. This one's by Max Oak Bluetti. I think Luigi designed this at Bluetti. But this is a 120 watt portable solar panel that you can just carry with you. And you can use this to recharge, for example, a lithium power station. And this lithium power station, I believe has a 500 watt inverter inside of it. It's basically a lithium battery with a bunch of outlets and an inverter. So it's, it's sort of the guts 
of a very simple solar system. If you're a tent camper, if you're a van camper, if you want to travel nimble and light, or if you just want to supplement the capabilities of your RV in a more inexpensive way, this is a good way to go. Yeah. Now, it's not nearly as nice as having a loaded solar package on your RV, but it really does give you the sort of same basic capabilities. You use your solar panel to recharge your lithium battery, and then you can juice up or run certain appliances using that power station. Something else you need to think of when you arrive in these sorts of destinations is the weather. You know, is it going to be sunny? Is it going to be raining? Is it going to be cloudy? Is it going to be windy? Is it going to be cold? So right now where we're camping, it has been very windy and at night it's getting really cold. So even sitting by the campfire, you're usually still cold. <laughs> you're bundled up. <laughs> Make sure that you're prepared with the proper gear before you get there because the weather in some of these places can be very different than the nearby towns. For instance, this location is at a higher elevation and more exposed than the town. So if we were camping in town, we would probably have a very different setup than camping out here in the Alabama hills. Make sure you have something that's like a windproof jacket if you're in those conditions. It will make you so much more comfortable. Having some small little fleece blankets that you can bring out to the campfire with you will make it a lot more comfortable. These are also great if you're camping in cold weather at night. We typically don't run our furnace overnight unless the temperature is going to drop below freezing. So it can get pretty cold in our airstream overnight. So having these little fleece blankets that you can stuff under the sheets next to your skin will help keep you a lot warmer. The other thing we use are Heat holders. Yeah. What are heat holders, you might ask? These are pretty much the best cold weather socks that we have found. These are almost like fleece blankets for your feet. <laughs> now they're sort of expensive socks. I think they're they're like 15, 15, 15 a bucks pair. a pair, which is kind of an expensive sock. But once you put them on, you'll know why they cost 15 bucks. <laughs> they're I, so thick, you really can't wear them with shoes. They, they have some thinner versions you can wear with shoes, but these super thick ones that we will get into bed with at night you're probably not gonna fit in a shoe. They're definitely thick and cushy. I mean, excuse my dry legs, but they're super warm. These do fit inside these boots. They don't fit inside my regular hiking boots. These are just a little too thick. They have a heat rating. They call it the TOG rating, which stands for thermal overall grade of 2.34. Whereas your ordinary cotton sock would be a 0 0.33. So they're like six or seven times as warm as a normal sock. Yeah, I, on a cold night, I've been known to just wear these through the night. And if you don't wear them through the night, they're the first thing that get on my feet in the morning when I get up to go make my coffee. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we use when we're out here to help warm things up is a heated blanket. We have a small throw size heated blanket and it does require electricity. So that's something you need to be you know mindful of so we can actually plug it into that max oak blue eddy and run it overnight on the low heat setting and it won't even run down that uh, max oak blue eddy to zero yeah even though we travel with a generator and a nice solar setup we still use these lithium power stations all the time recently we were camping in grand teton national park and we loaned our little lithium power station to our friends who were just sort of camping in the back of a minivan and it was getting down into the 20s at night mm -hmm. they had the heated blanket and the lithium power station and it really got them through the night and they were able to be comfortable and get a good night's sleep. I'm gonna peek into the master suite. Oh so nice. <laughs> now I'm kind of curious uh, so it ran all night long. It ran all night long. I still got 60% charge. Um, I think for the real estate they take up yeah. they are um, have a huge amount of payback. Um, yeah, a lot of us. functionality in a small package. Right. Brief consideration about internet. A lot of these places that are the really great boondocking sites are not very internet friendly. Yeah. If you really need the internet to work, you're going to have some issues. Like if you're a digital nomad and you're coming into these areas, for example, we were here with our friends Nader and Wendy. They had, uh, I believe, all the different cellular carriers 
when they were here and they still could not really get a reliable cellular connection in this location. So it's something to consider when you're picking your site because in this area that we're in, the Alabama Hills, we are about three miles in off the, the main road. And so it gives us this amazing view, but it also means we don't have that cell coverage. If we had chosen a site within the first half mile of the road, we actually would have cell service. We were getting four bars of 4G LTE service in that area. So it may be that you can still choose a site in a remote location, but maybe just not as remote as some of the other sites. Yeah, for us, we've had zero internet in our site, but we can take a short ride to town and we'll have internet service there and we're able to get some work done. Mm -hmm. Finally, I want to wrap up with a little wag of the finger and make a point about trash. Yeah. You know, we've been traveling uh, on the road for several months this year and we've seen a problem possibly developing of trash being left in campgrounds, at campsites, inside fire pits, or even inside bare food locker boxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were in a city park in Oklahoma, beautiful park, and there was a remarkable amount of trash, I'm sorry to report, in the campsite and in the fire pit. I mean, people just had just left everywhere. all it sorts of trash there. Unbelievable. In uh, Grand Teton National Park, in some of the bear lockers, you know, the park provides bear food lockers uh, where you can basically lock any kind of items that bears might be attracted to like in a safe grill. location. <laughs> yeah, like your grill or you know any kind of food that you might be carrying with you. People were leaving trash inside those food lockers. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of people RV traveling this year who just bought their RV for the first time. Maybe some people didn't know any better, but now you do. I don't think the people leaving trash in their sites are Lolojo Nation members, no. but it's something that we've noticed. And, you know, we were talking to our friends in California and they said they've seen an increase in just trash and rubbish being dumped in public areas yeah. on the sidewalk. But if you happen to be in a campsite and you notice some trash, just pick it up and put it in your bag and you know throw it out with your trash because if everybody can pick up a little bit here and there, it'll make the whole problem better. And hopefully when other people see you doing that, they'll be more mindful of their own disposal of trash and not wanna be the litter bug. Because it's a beautiful country that we have and if we take care of it, we'll be able to enjoy it. And and this BLM land will continue to be usable. But if people keep dumping trash, then I could foresee it being taken away from us. And so we don't want that to happen. Yeah, I do think maybe there are a few people who kind of don't know any better and leave trash inside a fire pit, but it's very important to know the fire pits are not trash receptacles. And we've spoken to, for example, campground hosts, and they said one of their number one problems with campers, as people leaving trash on the campsite, specifically in those fire pits. Mm -hmm. So don't leave your rubbish in fire pits. Clear that stuff out of there. Yeah. Because otherwise, somebody's got to do the work of going in to clean it up, mm -hmm. or our campgrounds turn into dumps. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> wants to camp in a trash pit. <laughs> So that's it guys, a look at RV boondocking. For newbies, we hope you found some of these tips helpful. All of you experienced RV boondockers out there who have watched this video, we invite you to comment beneath the video, maybe share some of your tips with our community so we can all get out there and enjoy our RVs even more in the great outdoors. Look at these locations and the places where you can go camp. We're actually standing in the very spot where Tony Stark of Iron Man released some sort of ridiculous weapon. It was the Jericho. The Jericho, That's where of he blew up the Jericho. So uh, you might recognize this site if you're an Iron Man fan. Yeah, I think he was, he was standing, what, like this? Uh, I think he was like this. Like this, he was sort of like this, presenting, boom. Presenting the uh, explosion that happened behind him. And no, they didn't really blow up those mountains. That was all CGI, thank goodness. <laughs>
<laughs> so that's kind of a really fun aspect of boondocking. You can take your RV out to really interesting locations and set up and just enjoy. We found this particular place in the Alabama Hills so pleasant and enjoyable that we lingered for several days. Most people cleared out of here after the weekend. Mm -hmm. So we've been staying here on weekdays and there have probably not been but half a dozen people here, period. Nobody really within sight of us currently. We had a neighbor last night and this is something else that you need to remember. Make sure your fire is really put out before you leave because this yeah. fire is still going. Yeah, and they not... left about four hours ago. So we're going to pour some water over it to make sure it's totally, you know, out. But I'm sure they thought it was out. They've got ash all over it. Yeah, that's another great uh, sort of safety tip and also a tip about boondocking. If you do light a fire, really make sure it's out because uh, this was not our fire pit behind us. Several couples were out here camping last night and obviously they didn't put their fire out. And, you know, I've heard there were a few fires in California this year. <laughs> just a few all right guys if you guys enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up share it with your friends and family leave a comment down below with your tips for boondocking and if you haven't yet please click that subscribe button down below it makes all the difference uh, we'll link most of these products in the description box below this video and we also ask that if you enjoy our content if you want to support long long honeymoon the easiest way to do that is to shop through our amazon storefront you can do that by visiting amazon.com shop slash long long honeymoon and you don't have to just buy things that are listed in our store you can actually use that search bar at the top and search for anything that amazon sells and as long as you start your shopping experience on our storefront we will earn a commission for your purchase and it doesn't cost you anything and if you really want to support long long honeymoon in this way it's a great idea to put a little bookmark to our store on your phone yes thank you so much for your support we greatly appreciate it the patreon link is fixed by the way oh, well, i yeah. think we've had a broken patreon link for many years yeah so if you're interested in supporting us in that way you can click that link as well but until next time what do we say Lolo ho. Lolo ho. Click that subscribe button. Thanks, guys. Uh, it works just as well. And you can. <laughs> I think so loud. It's going to be yeah. all over the audio. <laughs> Coming up on Long Long Honeymoon, we just got our Airstream ceramic coated at Vinnie's North Bay Airstream Repair. Stay tuned for all the details on the biggest upgrade we've ever made to our Airstream exterior.